Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest talk in the Cadith Lecture Series. I'm Sarah McGill, one of the managers of Research Information Services at Cadith, and it's my pleasure to be moderating today for the lecture session. I'd like to start by acknowledging that today's talk is being presented on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. The Cadith Lecture Series lets people from across Canada and beyond hear directly from prominent, prominent speakers, uh, prominent scholars, and opinion leaders about pressing issues facing health technology assessment and healthcare today. Today's lecture focuses on the impact of predatory journals and touches on topics including academic incentives, research funding, and science policy. I'm sure many of you in the audience today have received emails asking, would you like to uh, publish in our journal? That, and the journal title is suspiciously unfamiliar to you. Or perhaps a colleague has come to you with an article, but both of you notice that the journal publisher is one uh, that was in the news a few years ago about publishing junk science and being sued for it. How do you know if it's a legitimate journal or a predatory publisher only interested in profits, that cuts corners on quality process and produces substandard research or outright fake science. The availability of low quality work passed off as high quality work erodes confidence in scientific integrity and can result in bad decision making. This is an issue for anyone who cares about evidence informed decision making in healthcare. After the lecture, we're going to open things up for discussion and questions from our in-person participants as well as our online participants. It should be quite a discussion. We have over 600 registrants today. Uh, and I'd like to briefly, before we get started, introduce Danielle Rabb, my colleague uh, and Director of Research Information Services at Cadith, who will be helping me with questions today from the participants online. And online participants can answer, enter their questions at any time through the live stream platform. Participants in the room, please raise your hand if you have a question. Turn your microphone on when I call, call on you and please identify yourselves before you ask your question. So Cadith Lectures are social media friendly events. We have a hashtag. So we're encouraging you to tweet using the hashtag Cadith Talks. So now to introduce Kelly Kobe. Today's speaker, Kelly Kobe, is an investigator at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, or OHRI, working in the Center for Journalology. In her role, she conducts research on topics related to biomedical publishing, including publication models, publication policy, and research reporting quality. With an eye on improving the dissemination and use of health research, she addresses questions like, what are the consequences of reporting bias and poor quality reporting? How can researchers most effectively share their study findings and materials? And of course, what are predatory journals? And how do they impact organizations, researchers, and patients? She is, as an article by Tom Spears in yesterday's Ottawa Citizen uh, article put it, uh, a researcher who shadows, who, sorry, a researcher who studies the shadow, shadowy world of scammers who publish fraudulent medical journals. Her Twitter handle is KD Kobe, and I would encourage you to follow her. Please give a warm welcome to Kelly Kobe. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, all right, uh, it's really lovely to be here. Uh, it's such a great opportunity to uh, engage in a dialogue with so many of you uh, here in the room and across the country. I'm going to start off uh, just by uh, indicating that I don't have any conflicts of interest related to today's uh, talk or otherwise, um, but I do have a number of volunteer commitments that are unpaid within the scholarly landscape that I thought I'd highlight. So uh, I volunteer as an institutional pilot member for COPE, uh, the Committee on Publication Ethics. I'm a member of the Equator Network and an ambassador for the Center for Open Science. All right, today, uh, throughout my talk, I want to address three uh, questions. Uh, the first is simply, what are predatory journals? And it's actually a much more convoluted uh, 
discussion or debate than I'd like it to be. Uh, the second is uh, why predatory journals are actually a problem. And in that respect, I'm going to talk about how predatory journals impact upon organizations, researchers, and patients. And at the end, I'll talk about how we can stop predatory journals, some ideas I have, but I'd like a, a bit of a dialogue and discussion, uh, at least feedback on my ideas and suggestions from you in terms of how we can thwart this problem. Okay, so what are predatory journals? Uh, the term predatory journal was actually coined in 2012 by a librarian called Jeffrey Beale, and he's based in Denver, Colorado. And I think at the time, what Beale noticed was some dubious journals in the publishing landscape that he didn't think met best practice standards. And as a consequence of his sort of encounters with these journals, uh, what he started to do was to maintain what became known as Beale's List. So these are lists of journals that he thought were potentially predatory and publishers that he thought were potentially predatory. And uh, we began as a scientific community to use those lists as a resource uh, to avoid these dubious journals. So uh, what Beale felt was that these journals uh, essentially preyed upon researchers uh, for their manuscripts in order to make a profit, but they didn't necessarily care about uh, the scholarly outputs they were producing or adhere to scientific best practices. I think to really understand a little bit about how this term came to be and where the problem of predatory journals came from, we actually need to understand a bit more uh, or have some context for the history of publishing. So we have been publishing for a very long time. Uh, the first scientific publications came out in Paris and London, respectively, in 1665. Obviously, it was a print press back then. And what would happen is that uh, articles uh, were produced, and institutions or users wanting to read those articles would pay a subscription fee to the journal or, or bundles of journals. In the 90s, when the internet uh, became more prevalent and widespread, many journals or publishers started printing an online version in addition to their print press. Now, of course, many journals are exclusively online. Uh, but that shift uh, changed the speed at which knowledge could be uh, exchanged, uh, but it also led to something else. Um, the fact that uh, we could get access to large uh, bundles of journals online uh, meant that the subscription models changed. So uh, many more bundles of journals were put together uh, within publisher organizations and sold to, say, universities or librarians uh, for them to read. And that was problematic. It still is a, an ongoing debate and issue uh, even now uh, because the fees that these publishers were charging for access to those uh, materials were very high and they increased exponentially in a relatively short period of time. So um, a further problem, which is highlighted here on the screen, uh, it's a paper by Bergstrom and colleagues. And what they did is they looked at the prices institutions paid to access these bundles of subscriptions of journals or uh, publishers' uh, journals. And what they found was that um, similarly sized universities, so the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, paid 1.22 and 2.16 million, respectively, for the same access, the same amount of journals. So uh, essentially, uh, what this suggested is that these negotiations were not very transparent. They occurred behind closed doors. So we had two problems with this model. One, it was extremely expensive. And two, there was a lack of transparency or equitability in how these were negotiated from site to site. So as you can imagine, uh, this was quite frustrating. This problem, combined with, I think, a moral imperative to ensure that the work we produce, often from taxpaying dollars, is shared equitably amongst anyone wanting to read it, led to something called the open access uh, publication model. So this is quite widespread uh, now, so we do still have the subscription model, but many journals are open access. And I think when most researchers or individuals think about what it means for a journal to be open access, they think it means you click a button and you don't hit a paywall. So you can freely access the content from the journal. And that's true, but there is a second component in addition to that free access that is uh, central to open access publishing. And that is that the work is licensed under a copyright that makes it free to build on and uh, free to reuse. So those are the two sort of key components of open access. A third, it is optional, though it is very uh, typical, at least in the biomedical sphere, is that open access journals charge a fee to authors to publish. Uh, 
So if you'll remember what I said about the traditional subscription journals, you know, they f charge the librarians or the user to access the information or the, the institution. Uh, in this model, the place of payment has changed. So the user no longer pays to access the content, but actually the producer, the, the person writing uh, or groups of people writing the article actually pay to have it published. So uh, you can see that where the payment occurs in the publication process has changed between these models. Okay, so we know a little bit about the history of publishing. We know that we had this dominant uh, traditional subscription model that has now uh, been to an extent uh, replaced by the open access model, but both models still dominate. And the question here is where do predatory journals uh, fit in? Uh, you can uh, think of predatory journals as journals that fail to uphold expected best practice standards uh, and that they seek profit from the article processing charge common to the open access model. So predatory journals are open access journals that basically they want that article processing charge, but they don't necessarily care about running their business ethically or efficiently. They, they're there to make money primarily. Uh, I want to say that this is, I think, in general, how people view predatory journals, but there's actually no formal agreed upon de definition of what a predatory journal is or what specific features that journal must have to classify as being predatory. And I'll speak more about that and how that's caused problems within this sphere. Um, and I'll speak about a forthcoming definition that uh, our group and collaborators have put together. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, continue talking about uh, predatory journals and the problems they're causing and how we can stop them. But before I do, I wanted to take a minute and just pause and acknowledge the term predatory journal uh, may not be the best uh, term to use. So uh, I think Beale used this term with the idea that uh, researchers are being preyed upon by these uh, dubious journals for their manuscripts in order to make money. And that is the traditional thought, that these predatory journals do just that. They often undercut the open access model, so they charge uh, fees that are magnitude lower uh, for the author to, to publish their work. And, and in this way, they're regarded as predators. And I can definitely say in my experience, I've definitely uh, encountered researchers consulting locally at the Ottawa Hospital and other uh, Ottawa-based research institutes where this has happened. So senior colleagues of mine who on the one hand have published in say the Lancet or the BMJ, really prestigious medical journals, uh, on the other hand have also published in predatory journals. So they have been duped and, and this is obviously very embarrassing for these colleagues and you know they, they are quite ashamed of that experience. But I want to say before moving on that the predatory journal uh, may not always appear like the tiger on the, the left. It may be often more like my cat Strudel on the right. Um, it's, it's you know still a predator, uh, but perhaps uh, not as fierce as the cat on the left. Um, and the reason why I wanted to, to make this point clear is that um, a certain proportion of individuals may use these journals dubiously themselves because it provides them with an outlet to very easily get their work published, so to speak, um, and they can uh, share that content, they can add that publication to their CV or, or pad their CV with additional publications. So uh, it's been raised as a, as a problem, the terminology, and I just want to acknowledge that, but I'll continue to use predatory journal because it is the most commonly uh, known term for the phenomena I'm discussing. Uh, in relation to that, I think before moving on uh, in any discussion of predatory journals, it warrants discussion related to academic incentives. Uh, the fact is we currently live in an academic environment where we're rewarded for things like the number of publications over things like the quality of those publications. So in, in such a publish or perish uh, uh, environment, it's no wonder that uh, you know, there would be dubious bad apples, so to speak, that might turn to these predatory journals for quick publications or low barrier publications. Uh, transparency practices uh, such as protocol registration, data sharing, open science practices, open access publishing, uh, they tend not to be valued uh, tremendously by our organizations, although I would argue these are the central tenets of science. Um, they're not valued uh, because we're not evaluated on them or audited in any way for performing these practices. And thirdly, uh, there's actually little to no training. If, if training does exist, it's often very patchy 
on writing or how to get published. So uh, I think this speaks to sort of both types of people that may find themselves publishing in predatory journals. Uh, people are being duped because they're uh, unaware, and uh, also uh, people who use predatory journals uh, to publish their work. I've actually uh, experienced conversations with colleagues who say things like, for example, you know, I wouldn't publish my work there, but for my resident, it's a good good starting point. Or you know, for your graduate student, you want to just get something out there. So they don't recognize the problem with these journals. For example, not being indexed, not being archived, um, you know, not adhering to best practice standards. Okay, so uh, in terms of our overview of predatory journals, so far I've mentioned Beale coined the term in 2012. Uh, and from 2012 onwards uh, to 2015, what we basically saw was a lot of commentaries and a lot of opinion pieces about predatory journals, about what they are, about uh, why they exist, and about the problems they're causing. And editorials warning colleagues that these exist in the space and, and not to publish in them. The first actual major research on predatory journals was in 2015, published in 2015, based on data from 2014 by Shen and Bjork. And what they did is they tried to put a number on the scale of this problem. So they wanted to know how many predatory journals and publishers existed and how much they were publishing. And at this time, you can see uh, a trend over time increasing. In 2014, there was uh, approximately 8,000 predatory journals and publishers. And, uh, more than 400,000 articles published in those. So I think this study, these numbers I think are quite outdated. I think the scale of the problem is much, much greater now, um, but there's not been an, uh, a further study to capture these numbers. But this study was really useful because it put the phenomena on the map as being something quite widespread and problematic and not just sort of a few dubious journals that we ought to avoid. Uh, once that study came out, uh, you know, we continued to see a lot of editorials and comments about predatory journals. But around 2016, what we saw, started to see in the literature were a lot of sting studies. And what I mean by a sting study is essentially uh, researchers, or in some cases journalists, started submitting nonsensical articles or articles that were like obviously fraught in, in some way, so plagiarized or made up, uh, to particular journals or subsets of small groups of journals. And they wanted to see whether or not that journal would be accepted. And if so, what was their experience with peer review and so on. Um, so there are many, many examples. I'll show you just one. So this is a uh, paper that was submitted by, <coughs> by colleagues in New York. Uh, get me off your fucking mailing list. It was the text of the entire uh, manuscript. It also included not just one, but several figures um, <laughs> with the same text. And what they demonstrated was that this was able to get published. They paid an article processing charge, and this was able to be published in this predatory journal. And I think th these sting studies were important, and they had their place for a number of reasons. Uh, one, they definitely raised uh, a awareness of this issue. I think uh, it makes us laugh to, to read these studies or to hear of these sting studies. But after making us laugh, it makes us think. And it makes us think, you know, what are these journals? You know, how do they operate? Why did they come to be? And, you know, how do they fit in with the open access model that has sort of uh, replaced the subscription or, or at least paralleled the subscription-based model? We also, uh, as researchers, were so familiar with getting emails uh, to submit to predatory journals. So I think this particular sting study uh, really uh, got that message across of how frustrating it is for researchers to be solicited on a daily basis to submit manuscripts to journals they've never heard of, often which are completely out of our area of expertise. So in a given day, I may be asked to, for example, submit to a physics journal, an agriculture journal, and a medical journal, uh, all often from the same publisher or different publishers, none of which are uh, areas I have any expertise. Okay, so um, in 2017 is really when empirical research on predatory journals started to take off um, a lot more. So there, there's actually, when it comes to predatory journals, not very much. This is only a, a couple of years ago uh, when we really started investigating this in an empirical way. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the empirical literature on the topic. And, and although it is certainly not all the literature on the topic, I think it is a significant proportion. So in, in some ways, you leave the room an expert on predatory journal literature because there, there is so little that is actually empirical. Uh, so the, the first study that I wanted to mention is done by colleagues uh, at the Ottawa Hospital. And what they did uh, is they took three different groups of journals. They took journals presumed to be predatory, 
and that was uh, using Beale's list. So uh, they, these are journals that Beale thought to be predatory, and there are some limitations to doing that, but that was the easiest way to find potential predatory journals. And then they took a list of open access journals, so uh, that have uh, the, the model in which the author pays and it's free to access. And then they took a group of uh, traditional journals or hybrid journals, uh, which were typically available via subscriptions. And they did a comparative analysis of the features uh, that these journals had and looked at ways that predatory journals might be distinct. And they had about 100 of each uh, type of journal, and it was uh, each was randomly selected. And all of the journals were biomedical. And what they came up with were 13 salient characteristics of predatory journals. So these are evidence-based from their sample. I can't go through all of them because I don't have time for that today, but I wanted to just highlight some of the things that they, they found. So uh, one of the things is what I mentioned. So the interest, the scope of interest of the journal uh, contains non-biomedical topics alongside biomedical. So this was a, a red flag, so to speak. So when you see a journal of you know, cancer, agriculture, and um, robotics, this is probably uh, a little bit dubious that they'd, they'd be doing all of that at one journal, uh, but that's common in predatory journals. They try to lump broad fields together that don't necessarily seem like they'd fit. Uh, another uh, common issue with these journals is they have images that are distorted or fuzzy so that they don't look very professional, or they're intended to look like something they're not, or they're unauthorized altogether. Uh, and the other example I just wanted to highlight of the 13 is they often, uh, predatory journals highlight bogus metrics. So sometimes they're entirely made up, the metrics. Other times uh, they have some sort of calculation behind them, such as the index Copernicus value, but it only ever goes up, that value. And I think they try to frame it as though it is the journal impact factor, even though it's not that calculation. So I'm going to go through a, a few of examples of some of the trickery predatory journals use. So this is the, the first one. So these were taken directly from websites uh, studied in this uh, particular research paper. So this is the Elixir International Journal. Does anyone notice anything about this journal? Anything look interesting about it? Getting Looks like Elsevier, exactly. So uh, a little bit of image recognition perhaps there. It looks like they've tried to you know, use a tree that, that would maybe like uh, to the Elsevier logo. Uh, okay, what about this one? There's two journals here. We've got the American Journal of Advanced Drug Delivery and the American Journal of Drug Delivery. One predatory, one legitimate. Show, we'll do a show of hands uh, for the folks in the room and uh, I'll report to the folks listening online. Um, who thinks the one on the left is the legitimate journal? Not a single hand. And the one on the right? Okay, we've got a lot more hands. Uh, anyone care to share why? Someone who voted from the, the one on the right being the legitimate one? I recognize the Springer link, Brennan. Exactly, so she's saying she, she recognizes Springer as a, a known and, and popular publisher. So I think that that is the, the only real way to have uh, recognized between these two journals unless you actually know the journals uh, from publishing there or reading the journal. Um, but what I think this highlights is two things. The first is, doesn't the one on the left look quite professional? I mean, if I landed on this website, uh, I think a lot of people think predatory journals are super under-resourced. It's, it's you know, people in their basements. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, but this looks like quite a professional website. And the second thing I think, uh, that it highlights is the similarity in the names. So you can see that this predatory journal has chosen a name not identical to, but very similar to a legitimate journal. And this is uh, something we know occurs with predatory journals. Sometimes they do take the exact name, but they are trying to appear as though there's something they are not. So you can imagine if you are a researcher in this area, uh, perhaps you're early in your career uh, or your uh, early in your publication experiences, you know, someone may have said to you, uh, why don't you consider American Journal of Drug Delivery? You go to Google, you type in American Journal of Drug Delivery search, and up pops this hit. You can totally imagine how someone might think in error that the one on the left is the journal on the right. Or they may just be searching for journals on drug delivery and end up on the, the journal on the left. Okay, these are a list of examples of bogus metrics that Beale had curated uh, that predatory journals often list on their website. 
So you can see lots of different ones, Cosmos impact factor, the index Copernicus, science impact factor. Um, again, as I suggested, uh, these are uh, metrics that either make no sense at all or are trying to make it seem like they're the traditional impact factor that so many people know and obsess over. So uh, raise your hand in the room if you've heard of the impact factor, the general impact factor. Okay, so keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you've heard of it. Um, put your hand up or put, put your hand down if you do not know the organization that assigns impact factor. Okay, so every hand is down that was up. So I think this is uh, really telling, right? So for, for those online, several people raised their hand and, and yet none of them knew uh, the organization that assigns impact factor. As an academic uh, environment, uh, we, we obsess over impact factor, you know? Higher the impact factor, the better. And we all want to be in the highest impact factor journals because that's what our institutions value and reward us for. And yet, we know so little about it. Uh, most people in this room, I'm sure, couldn't define uh, how it's calculated. And uh, you don't know who assigns it. So the organization that assigns uh, impact factor is Clairvoyant. It used to be Thomson Reuters, but they were bought out a few years ago. So you could actually verify when you're looking at a journal's website, if it claimed to have a metric, that it indeed does have that metric and it's assigned through the responsible organization. Okay, so I've talked about uh, what predatory journals are and how they operate and the trickery and the sort of unprofessional practices they have from a business perspective. Um, after that research had been conducted, our group then asked the question, uh, what actually gets published in predatory journals? So can't all be sting papers, right? They must be making money off of, of something beyond that. So we uh, conducted a study in uh, 2017 and we asked two key questions. So we wanted to look at the epidemiological characteristics of predatory journals. Uh, so like who published there, where they were from, features like that. And then secondarily to that, uh, we wanted to assess the reporting quality of the work published in those outlets. So as part of this research, uh, we conducted a study in which we uh, selected a, a very large random sample of almost 2,000 biomedical articles that were published in predatory journals. So uh, this took some time. I'm, I'm having flashbacks just thinking about it. Um, but it, it was worthwhile because I think we found uh, a number of really important key findings that helped uh, us better understand the predatory journal uh, model and, and what actually ends up there. So one of our key findings uh, that I'll highlight today is that uh, we found that 38.5% of the corresponding authors of these articles in our sample were actually from high income countries. And this is important for a number of reasons, but I think that the key reason here is that there was an existing perception in the scholarly communications landscape that predatory journals were a problem for low income countries, it was not a global phenomenon, it was isolated, and for some reason there was a sense that it was a problem for India in particular. This study threw that on its head and it said that that is not the case. Researchers literally all over the world are publishing in these journals and it's a global phenomenon. Uh, further to that, we looked at the institutions of researchers uh, who had been captured in our sample. So this is based on the corresponding author's affiliation. Many prestigious institutions, uh, including my own, were captured in this uh, sample. Uh, we also looked at uh, the top 10 in our sample. Harvard University was amongst that top 10. So again, this really suggested that this is not a low-income country problem. Uh, this is a global phenomenon. Uh, another thing that we found looking at the epidemiological characteristics was that uh, the work published in these outlets uh, in many cases was funded. So funding uh, was supporting this work and we looked at exactly who provided these researchers with their funding. And what we found was that the number one funder of biomedical research in our large sample of predatory articles was the NIH, so the Americans' uh, largest national institutes of health funder. Uh, so that's, that's quite problematic. So it was almost 13% of our sample had NIH funding. And when we looked at the rest of the funding, um, 36% roughly and 35% roughly came from academic and government agencies uh, separate from the NIH. So this is, this is a large proportion of tax dollars being spent on disseminating research in outlets that are not indexed, are not archived, are unlikely to do peer review, and don't have the necessary sort of safety checks like plagiarism detection software in place. So I think that that's, that's quite problematic, and I think as a, a taxpayer uh, or, or as a citizen, that's not how I think most people would want their money spent. When we looked at the reporting quality of these articles, what we did is we 
uh, cross-check each manuscript with the corresponding reporting guideline checklist. So if you're not familiar with the uh, reporting guidelines, they're uh, checklists of essential information you should report in your manuscript. You can find them on the Equator Network. And basically, we, we cross-checked all of our papers, and we came up with uh, values in terms of how well each paper was reported, and we grouped them based on uh, research design. And uh, the long and short of it is that reporting was abysmal. So this suggested to us that you know, if very key basic information from the study, such as whether it obtained ethical approval, whether the study used randomization, um, very basic information about analyses is absent, it suggests there's no vetting, there's no peer review taking part, uh, because these were things we would expect to have caught during that process. I will say the reporting of legitimate biomedical research is suboptimal. Uh, but this was a magnitude worse. So this was not, not quite like what we see in terms of weaknesses in the legitimate uh, literature. In our sample of articles, there was uh, over 2 million patients that were reported uh, in the data and more than 8,000 animals uh, in, in our sample. So I think this is really problematic. If you think about it, if I, as a, a patient, take part, let's say, in a clinical trial, I think I have certain expectations of that trial, and I think those expectations are very much warranted. So for instance, I would expect that the work that I'm contributing to goes on to be shared in some format, and that that sharing or dissemination is responsible. So you know, uh, the animals, uh, as, as another example, in addition to the patients, many of the animals in our work uh, that we captured will have lost their lives as a consequence to the, the research study being uh, produced. And I think we would argue, as a society, many of us feel that that is you know, something we're willing to accept because that helps inform improved health care and it helps inform, you know, cures and interventions to treat diseases. But one would argue that if this work is being published in a predatory journal, it's not going to be read because it's not indexed or, or disseminated appropriately. You know, what was that an efficient use of those lives? Okay, so um, after we did uh, our large study, uh, there were a number of other studies uh, that took place. Uh, are on the topic of predatory journals. And I don't have time to highlight all of them, but I'm going to highlight three other papers that I think make uh, various different points related to predatory journals. So uh, the first is by Bags and colleagues. And what they did is they examined 46,000 CVs of researchers in Italy going up for promotion. And they found that approximately 5% of those uh, CVs or individuals uh, had predatory journals on their CV. So, uh, that's, that's a significant proportion, I think. If you ask any CEO of a large business if you could increase your efficiency of your company by 5%, they'd want to know what steps they could take to, to tackle that problem. Yet, you know, this, this paper is three years old and I don't think much has been done. Um, they surveyed the authors who had those predatory publications on their CV, and many of them did say, you know, we didn't really get peer review or the peer review wasn't very good. So it's suggesting that the, the journals are perhaps uh, subpar. Uh, in work that we did uh, this past year, uh, we surveyed 82 authors of biomedical uh, papers published in predatory journals. And we asked them a little bit about you know, how they chose their journal and why they ended up submitting to this one. And many of them, so 41%, uh, indicated that they had an email invitation that they'd responded to. And I think these email invitations are getting increasingly more sophisticated, so they're not always in broken English and they're not always uh, unprofessional. Sometimes they're really specific. They'll uh, specify a paper that you've published in a legitimate journal elsewhere, and they'll say, you know, based on reading this, we like your work, do you have anything else? So it seems like a, a really direct solicitation. If you're early in your career or inexperienced, this may seem like an opportunity. But beyond the email invitations, we found that actually 28% of these people found their journal based on an online search. And I think this is really interesting because it corresponds to my own experiences as a consultant uh, at the Ottawa Hospital and in the Ottawa uh, area. Several of the people I know who have published in predatory journals inadvertently, they, they did search for their journal online. And the reason they did that is not because they have no idea where to publish and they're, they're sort of uh, junior in, in their experience, but it's because they'd already submitted their article to two or three or four outlets that they know and they read and they, they know as legitimate, but it had been rejected. So after submitting to those journals that they're comfortable with and where they typically go, they didn't know where to go next. So they went to the internet to sort of find somewhere. And they landed on sites like the one I showed you. And you know it, it didn't look too bad, so they submitted there. Uh, two other things uh, that we found in this study. Um, in, in our work, 
actually many of these folks said that they did experience peer review and that that peer review was actually quite helpful. So a couple of questions there. What is a helpful peer review and, you know, were these people, uh, many of them couldn't share their peer reviews, so there's no clear evidence of, of what their peer review looked like. But it may suggest uh, a couple of things, and one is that some predatory journals often uh, allow some articles to be published for free, and uh, they may do some sort of peer review in order uh, to get content on their website to then solicit uh, research from others. It looks like they're legitimate. You know, there's some genuine scholars who have published in their work or in their journal, and they, they can attract more, and they can uh, maybe loosen their practices or uh, charge those people, whereas they didn't charge the original people. And finally, uh, work by Mank and colleagues, uh, published in Neuroscience, what they did I think is, is really interesting. They looked at 78 and 101 journals in neuroscience and neurology respectively, and what they found was that 16 and 25 percent uh, of those journals were indexed in PubMed. So I think this is like both good and bad news. So uh, on the one hand, it suggests that these dubious outlets are seeping into PubMed, which we consider legitimate, we use for our searches, um, which obviously we, we don't want that. Um, but on the other hand, if, if good quality work in error ends up in these predatory journals, well, then you're able to find it if it, if it comes into PubMed. Um, so I think it's sort of a, a double-edged sword. Um, they also found that the number of legitimate journals in neurology was actually lower than the number of predatory journals in neurology. So this just speaks to the scale of the, the problem and navigating this landscape of journals is, is quite confusing, I'm sure, for these scholars. Okay, so I've talked a lot uh, about what predatory journals are, and I'm going to shift focus now and talk about uh, why they're a problem uh, for uh, organizations, researchers, and patients. I'm going to start off by talking about patients. So. Um, Patients, I think, have an obvious stake in this as, uh, you know, their clinicians may be using uh, the health research. They themselves might use the health research. Uh, in order to sort of illustrate the point, uh, I wanted to share a story with you uh, about how predatory journals can impact upon patients. And that's a story uh, from a colleague of mine who, in uh, 2015, unfortunately, uh, his mother-in-law was quite unwell. She was dying of breast cancer. And she'd undergone chemotherapy, and she'd undergone radiation and they were not successful in treating her cancer. And I think this, this, from what I understand, was a woman, you know, she wanted to keep fighting, she wanted to live, and uh, she made the decision to seek out uh, treatment from an alternative medical practitioner. And that individual, which was here in Canada, um, provided her with, among other things, an article which was describing a novel treatment using vitamins to treat her breast cancer. So it was a vitamin transfusion therapy. So she brought this home, and I think it perhaps gave her some hope of a, a new treatment or new options, uh, but fortunately her son-in-law is very much in this space and he immediately recognized the article as having been published in Omics, which is a large and well-recognized predatory publisher. But I think that this, this story illustrates two things. It illustrates that predatory journals can end up in the hands of clinicians as well as patients and that the reports uh, that they describe can directly impact patient and clinicians' care plans for, for themselves or for, for their patients. So I think that's hugely problematic. Um, our, our group, you know, we study meta-science topics or science of science uh, publishing, and uh, that's not a, a clinical thing per se, but we study clinical or biomedical literature. And what we found really useful is incorporating patient partners uh, in our research to get their perspectives on, uh, you know, how this problem might affect them and what potential solutions we might be able to drive to um, you know, remove this problem from their uh, environment. So we have uh, three uh, wonderful patient partners, uh, Donna, Lori, who's here today actually in the room, uh, and Marvelous. And what we're trying to do is in developing solutions to address predatory journals, consider the patient perspective and develop a user-centered design tools uh, that can uh, help ensure that fewer members of the public and patients are ending up with these uh, predatory journals, and if they do end up with them, they have tools to evaluate the quality of the source they're reading. Okay, so what about uh, funders? So um, I've talked about uh, predatory journals uh, being a problem and, and there being a lack of audit and, and, and training in terms of uh, publication science. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting from a funder perspective 
is that we in Canada, like in many other nations, have implemented mandatory open access uh, publishing policies. So uh, I've talked about the different publication models, the subscription model and the open access model. Well, in Canada, if you're funded by any of the three tri-agencies, uh, you have to make your work open access or publicly available within 12 months of publication. And I think this is really great. Of course, we want people to uh, equitably access that work. But it's really interesting because despite having such a policy, there's no support. So there's no support for uh, people to actually implement that. So researchers are left uh, to their own devices. It's their own responsibility to make sure that they're meeting that mandate. And I think that's problematic because with so many predatory journals in the landscape that are open access, these actually publishing in these journals actually meets that mandate, technically speaking, because there's no, no formal guidance on other responsible dissemination criteria we should be considering. So I think that's quite problematic. I will say that in response to the large study I mentioned of the 2,000 articles uh, that we studied uh, the epidemiological characteristics of, and we found that the NIH in America was the number one funder in our sample, shortly after that paper was published, the NIH released a statement on predatory journals and on responsible dissemination of research. So I think that's a starting point, but in the absence of audit and in the absence of supports to, to actually assist researchers to practically avoid these journals, I think it falls short of uh, optimal uh, achievement. Okay, why are uh, predatory journals a problem for organizations? Uh, well, there's lots of different types of organizations I could talk about, um, but today I thought I would just highlight two examples and both of these examples come from uh, reports of a Ottawa-based journalist, Tom Spears, uh, who's actually done a lot in, in, in the Canadian environment uh, and beyond for raising awareness of uh, what predatory journals are and the problems they cause within science, but also within the public sphere. So um, in, in two uh, different articles Tom has published, uh, the first is Health Canada kept predatory publisher despite warning uh, about shoddy science from government experts. So, in this case, basically, Health Canada had been using a predatory publisher based in Croatia to sort of get their work through with little vetting, and they could share that work in an open access format. And when it was uh, raised by a librarian working at Health Canada that this was sort of a dubious outlet known to be predatory and problematic, um, they didn't really see it as an, an issue initially, and I think part of that is because they're not educated about uh, the problems in the scholarly landscape, and there's there's not a lot of support and ongoing education on this topic, and the, the folks within their organization that had this knowledge, uh, they were not sort of empowered to be part of the discussion in terms of uh, making selections of journals, so I think maybe that uh, changed or should change uh, how those decisions are made. And the second article, Predatory Journal has firm grip on universities in Ottawa and Canada. So this was published in January of last year, and I remember it well. Uh, so what Tom did is he searched a uh, predatory publisher's website for Canadian affiliations, and then popped up a bunch of articles showing that you know researchers across the country very recently and in ongoing fashion are publishing actually in predatory journals. And he highlighted a few researchers that were based in Ottawa, some at my institution, some at uh, also at the U of O and uh, Carleton and other institutions across Canada. And you know certainly this started a discussion at our institution. You know. Uh, what are we doing? Are we doing enough to ensure that this is not happening? So uh, I think that there's definitely um, a sense that, you know, people, organizations, they don't like article headlines like this, right? So this does not do anything positive for the perception of science in the community or the perception of these institutions. Uh, from an organizational perspective, I think uh, the lack of training in journalology or publication science, it, it remains the underlying issue for much of this. There's also a lack of internal support. So for example, uh, we have grants officers at the front end of research to help us get funding to do the re research that we do. Uh, throughout the course of the research, we have methodologists and statisticians we can draw upon, but at the end phase, most institutions offer little, phase, uh, little support with uh, the dissemination phase. And there's, again, no monitoring or auditing going on. Okay, so for researchers, so for those of you who are researchers in the room, uh, why are predatory journals a problem? Well, of course, uh, you might inadvertently publish in one, and if you do, uh, what I would suggest is retracting your article and submitting to a legitimate journal. It's not always a linear process with these predatory journals, but uh, you, you can try to get your article retracted, and if you can't, or even if you do, you can always make a preprint of your article that will be indexed and disseminated and can be cited and shared responsibly. 
Uh, a question I often get from researchers, and I, I, was, I received it today as well, uh, how to deal with predatory journals in systematic reviews? Well, I think one problem is that it's really difficult to identify a predatory journal. In the absence of a definition of what a predatory journal is, it's, it's sort of difficult to, to say that you have actually captured a predatory journal. But if you feel quite strongly, for instance, it's from omics, which has been sued and is well recognized in the community, uh, what I would suggest uh, doing is, you know, you can write in your protocol how you'll handle these journals, and you can uh, then handle them accordingly in your analysis and, and your write-up. Um, but I would suggest, you know, do the risk of bias assessments. Um, you could do a secondary uh, subgroup analysis where you remove that article and explain why. But I think we need to be clear about the decisions we're making to include and exclude articles and apply those same decisions across all the articles we see in our sample. Okay, so lots of negative stuff so far, all, all about problems predatory journals are talking, uh, causing for organizations, researchers, and patients. Uh, how can we stop predatory journals? Well, uh, I think um, a starting point is to develop a consensus definition of what a predatory journal is. And so just to, to finish off your continuum, uh, that's exactly what we've been working on in our group. So we held a summit here in Ottawa uh, in April of this year, and we brought together uh, experts from a variety of stakeholder groups, including those I've mentioned, in addition to uh, publishers and policymakers, to agree on a consensus definition of what a predatory journal is. And we also mapped potential solutions to the problem of predatory journals. And one solution that we've come up with, and I'd love to hear feedback on, is the idea of a one-stop shop to address predatory journals. So this would include uh, a website of resources, it would have online learning modules for different stakeholders, so for members of the public and patients and for researchers. Uh, it would also have a journal authenticator tool. So what this is, as we conceive of it, it's basically an online internet plugin that users could download, and it's conceptually similar to the Altmetric bookmarklet, if you're familiar with that. So basically, there'd be a, a tab that you could click up here on your screen. So with the Altmetric, you can see it there. When you press that button, you, with Altmetric, you get this donut-like, uh, colorful donut-like shape and a score. Uh, what we would do is we would have something come up that also provides a score and a variety of indexes about the journal. So, you know, does it have a retraction policy? Is it indexed? Where is it indexed? Um, does it have a legitimate uh, subscription uh, model uh, or not? Does it do peer review? There would be different types of indicators built into the tool, but it's conceptually similar. And then policies could be developed, for example, um, that we would uh, integrate with the tool. So an agency could say, you know, if you do not get a score of X on the authenticator tool, that is not an outlet we would consider a responsible choice for journal submission. So we would like to provide the community with this tool and with policy drafts that they could modify and use for their own purposes. And uh, finally, we'd like to include uh, non-technical summaries on our one-stop shop to raise awareness and, and to gain awareness of the problems uh, predatory journals cause for the public. Uh, before uh, concluding, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I can't give a talk without saying, you know, it's very difficult to get funded in this space. So uh, research on research or meta-research uh, is needed, and meta-research on predatory journals, I think, is important to address the phenomena. It continues to grow, and if we don't have money to research it, uh, we, we can't tackle it appropriately. Uh, any definition we create of what a predatory journal is will require monitoring and updating over time. And it's, it's only when agencies and stakeholders come together with money to address this problem, I think through education, through policy, and through audit, will we actually address the issue. And uh, finally, uh, just an, another comment about incentives. So I've, I've talked about you know, this potential solution, the, the one-stop shop and the journal authenticator tool. Uh, but I think uh, a parallel discussion that really needs to intersect with the work that we're doing in uh, meta science and, and, and publications and predatory journals uh, really needs to speak to the incentive system we have. Because I think if we change the incentive system and we start evaluating things like the quality of publications uh, or evaluating things like transparency practices, uh, people will just stop publishing in predatory journals because uh, that will not be the, what is counted. Number of publications or the speed of publication won't be what matters. It matters uh, more about the, the quality of what you're doing and the transparency practices that you're using. So, I think that that discussion needs to occur simultaneously in terms of driving solutions in this area. Okay, so that's it for me. I'm going to stop there. Um, I just want to say thank you all uh, for your attention and for the opportunity to uh, dialogue about this. And I'm happy to take questions. I understand there's some folks online who can ask questions too. So thank you.
thank you so much, Dr. Kobe. Uh, so we have time now for some questions, and we're going to take as many questions as possible for the next uh, little little over um, so ten, minutes. ten minutes. Great. Okay. So we're going to alternate questions in the room and online. So just a reminder again, if you're in the room, please raise your hand, and when I call on you, use your microphone in front of you. And online, uh, you will be able to type those in, and Danielle and I will field those. And please don't forget to introduce yourself. Okay, so maybe we'll start with um, any questions in the room. Yes. Dr. Kobe, thanks. That was a great talk. Uh, Sarah Kangora from the CMPA. Um, throughout the entire talk, I kept coming back in my mind to how like given that there's no consensus definition for predatory journals, how is all this research occurring? For instance, the study that you um, presented on the epidemiological features of predatory journals, how would you have defined that? And I understand like, it would have been sort of a research-based definition, but given that there is no standardized definition, what are some of the key challenges that you're coming up against in trying to establish that uh, consensus definition for predatory journals? Yeah, it's a really great question. So much of the research that I've mentioned, if not all of it, um, has actually used or in some capacity drawn from Beale's list. So Beale had created these lists um, based on his criteria, but I think there were problems with that in that it wasn't transparent, the criteria he used necessarily, and, and how to actually identify journals. Um, you know, if they're not indexed and they're not archived in any way, like it's, it's difficult to even find them. So it's a, it's a challenge that we have definitely faced. So we've used Beale's List noting those limitations. Um, I think in terms of developing a consensus definition, uh, there's, there's a lot of voices uh, around, you know, what a potential predatory journal could be, and much of that is informed in part by, by Beale. Um, what we did is very systematic. So we did a Delphi process, so it's a round of three stages of voting, and the last stage was done in person. Um, and that was informed, uh, the questions we asked in the sort of surveys iteratively to these world experts in this area um, were informed by a scoping review that I conducted. So we, we looked at all research done on predatory journals that was empirical, and we extracted any characteristic across all of those studies that was a characteristic describing predatory journals. And they were all treated equally, irrespective of study design, who did it or what. And that was sort of an uh, initial starting point for the discussion. Um, I will say that you know we've arrived at nearly a, a consensus definition that that's, should be forthcoming. Uh, once we have that, the hope is to operationalize it in such a way that you know it feeds into our journal authenticator tool, uh, but it also feeds into things like policies and, and research as well. Great. Danielle, are there any questions online? Thanks, Sarah. Yep, one came in. So this person asks, what is the first line strategy a researcher should use to determine if a journal is legitimate? Okay, uh, good and very practical question. So I think um, if you're looking at an open access journal, um, the best resource that I would suggest is the directory of open access, access journals. So you can go there and you can type in your journal name if it's open access. And uh, in my view, if your journal is not listed in the directory of open access journals and it claims to be open access, I would not publish there. There's a slight caveat in that very new journals, it takes time to actually be listed because they have to be considered. Uh, however, I think in general, if, if I was publishing an open access journal and it, it wasn't there, I would, I would not move forward with that publication. Any additional questions in the room? Amanda Hodson from Cadith. Um, you mentioned peer review in a few slides back, and I'm curious um, if the peer review process, like are peer reviewers also being targeted and um, uh, approached by predatory journals, or is it some other sort of process um, that you discovered in your research? Yeah. Um, so in, in the research that we've done, um, there is definitely in some of these journals, peer review occurring. So uh, we know that from people who we've surveyed who have published in these journals, and they say, you know, there was peer review. So uh, I think it, it, it varies across the spectrum. Some people say, no, there wasn't, but certainly some do say that they experienced peer review. I can say in a, in a study that uh, 
we have done and is also uh, forthcoming that we'll hopefully be sharing soon. Um, what we did is we submitted uh, actually the manuscript that I described, uh, the Nature paper where we looked at the 2,000 biomedical uh, predatory publications. We submitted that to a series of presumed predatory journals in its exact nature formatted PDF and then as a Word document. And in the submission process to some of these journals, uh, we were required to suggest reviewers, so we suggested our colleagues. And some of them actually did get requests to review, so we know from that experience that they do send out the requests. Uh, what they do with them or, or how they decide on you know, acceptance is unclear to us. I don't think there has been a lot of research on the quality of peer review at legitimate journals, much less at predatory journals. So what I can say to answer your question is it seems some journals that are predatory do something, uh, but we don't know much about the quality, and I su suspect it's variable. Danielle. So this is a two-part question. So are you worried that an authenticator tool would give the predatory journals a template for how to trick the tool? And also, do you have any thoughts about addressing predatory conferences? Mm -hmm. Um, so concerning the, the comment about the authenticator tool, I think absolutely that that would be something that we would consider. I think that predatory journals, it's so clear like it's an arms race. You know, anything we do to respond to them, you know, they can respond to us and that tool will require uh, updating and auditing over time to ensure that it's, uh, you know, it's meeting its, its remit. Um, but I would also say, you know what? If, if journals, uh, journals are neither predatory or legitimate, I think uh, there's a big spectrum of journals. And unfortunately, I think most journals sit somewhere in a gray area in between. And if journals, by us creating an authenticator tool, it, it moves the spectrum along and they become more legitimate uh, or they enhance their practices in some ways, I think that that's only a positive thing. But I think uh, we would definitely want to make sure that we're auditing that tool over time. Um, it may also be legitimate journals can increase their practices too based on that definition or, or be more explicit in practices they're already doing because a lot of this is behind closed doors. Uh, as it pertains to predatory conferences, I've done a little bit of research on the topic, uh, not a great deal. I think it's, it's definitely a related phenomenon. Many of the predatory journal publishers have corresponding conferences, so it's, uh, sometimes it's the, the exact entity uh, doing this. Um, I think that uh, in addressing uh, parts of the, the predatory journal uh, phenomena, uh, we will perhaps address bits of that because if we th stop those uh, manuscripts from going to those entities, it may be that they uh, no longer do other types of dubious behaviors. But uh, I think it's, it's in part a separate question that requires um, additional investigation, but I do know that it's often the same entities. We'll probably take one or two more questions. Anyone in the room? Danielle, is there anyone online? If you need a minute. OK. So I, I have one uh, from myself and uh, some of my colleagues at, in our team. So we're, we're librarians. Um, and uh, I thought it was really, really well and clear put how you indicated when you're looking at a, a journal article um, that was published in a predatory journal, um, that when you're writing your protocol, developing a systematic review, that you're very clear on how you're going to handle these in your systematic review, clear on the decisions that you'll be making. Mm -hmm. To go a little bit further down the rabbit hole, if you're looking at existing current reviews and you notice that in their reference list, their included studies are, uh, there's some predatory publications in there. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice do you have for that? So is this when you're updating a review? I uh, know when you're, when you're uh, doing a review of reviews. Okay. Um, I think, again, um, risk of bias assessment would, would capture that in, in some degree. I think that uh, I, I wonder about in terms of noticing the, the, the journal article as being predatory. You would just want to ensure that you're, whatever criteria you're applying to that article, you've applied to all the articles uh, in your sample. Um, I think it's definitely a, a problem. I think what would be really nice for, for journals and for publishers uh, to sort of talk about a sort of parallel instance where this occurs, I think even more often, is um, you know editors of uh, journals, when you submit your work there, you reference uh, 
you know, all these different articles, they too want to ensure that they're not, like they're a legitimate publisher and they don't want to reference illegitimate journals. So uh, our tool could perhaps also uh, screen through lists of articles. And that's uh, conceptually something we've considered. But I think at this point, um, you know, you can, you can develop criteria to consider that. And in, in a standard systematic review, the risk of bias assessment would, would sort of take away that noise to an extent. Can you comment on the controversy of Onco Target? It was declared as predatory, but there's been some discourse on whether it is or isn't, and a rising number of cancer researchers publishing in this journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm um, somewhat familiar with Onco Target. Obviously, it's not my, my clinical area of expertise. Um, so it was uh, listed in PubMed, now it's been delisted. Uh, I think what I would suggest for Onco Target is the same thing I'd suggest for, for any journal. Um, you know, uh, a journal that was once good doesn't always have to be good. A journal that was once bad doesn't always have to be bad. Uh, so, you know, each time you're looking at a journal, you should consider if it claims to be open access, is it in the directory of open access? Is it indexed? You know, what are, look at what's being published there. Are, are recent articles, they seem quality to you. I would approach each journal uh, in the iteration, uh, I'm seeing it um, with those questions. And I think when it comes to, to OncoTarget, there's been some clear steps uh, from the scholarly communication to suggest that some of its practices are, are maybe not what they used to be or not meeting those best practice standards. So that's not to say that if you publish in the journal five years ago, the journal was not legitimate then, but I think um, there's been some indication that there's, there's problems there. And one real problem at predatory journals and at legitimate journals is, again, peer review is, is sort of the, this black box, and we, do, we don't know uh, what occurs uh, behind uh, journal walls in terms of uh, peer review, editorial review, and decision making. And unless journals are willing to share that information or open up the peer review process, it's difficult to make, I think, these judgments about how a particular journal is operating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kobe. This has been a, a really great, informative session. Um, so we are just about out of time, and so I wanted to extend a huge thanks to Dr. Kobe again for coming and speaking to us today. And you've given us some really useful advice on identifying predatory journals, and uh, a lot of insight into the scholarly and publishing landscape uh, for, for that. Uh, so thank you to everyone today who joined us for the talk. And please watch the Cadith website for de details of the next Cadith lecture. And as a reminder, the Cadith 2020 symposium is coming up. So there is a call for abstracts out. It's now open. And so check the Cadith website for more details about our conference and submitting your abstracts. So see you next time. Thank you again.